We're in Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to specifically look at this curse on the woman and how it is affected thousands of years later, every generation, and especially the end times generation. I think everything has been kicked up a notch as we are getting closer to the return of the Lord. And so um, let's take a look at just bring it back to, to where we were in Genesis 3. The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, she had no, she didn't say, wait a minute, this is a donkey speaking or something. She wasn't freaked out about it. So there's some things about Genesis that are really a mystery. I mean, a serpent, it's called the shining one. This being starts talking to her. And we would go, time out. She didn't. So we really don't have any idea. I'm sure, you know, parrots were probably talking. They still do. Uh, I don't know if the donkeys were, but they did. And one of them did at least. And so who knows? I mean, I, it just, and sometimes I look at the dog and he's telling me open the door and I know it. So I don't know. Uh, but it, just so much of that we don't know. And so he talks to her and she's like, oh yeah, you know, and she takes up the conversation. So there's some mystery. But because the serpent means shining one, he took on this persona, an earthly persona of a, as a shining one, as the serpent. And uh, God brings judgment upon that physical being. And of course, the spiritual being, the devil himself is still present, but the, the result of what happened is here with us today as far as serpents. Uh, but it, it wasn't like, oh, a snake. You know, he, what she was seeing based upon what we understand the word means was this glorious uh, being that was there in the garden and uh, uh, seems to be based upon the curse that's upon her and based upon what he was doing, uh, uh, based upon Genesis 6 and the spirit beings there and the women, that he liked her. I mean, he, there, was, there was something he was trying to build as far as a relationship. And uh, we know that because the curse upon him was there's gonna, you're going to be the enemy. You're going to be enemies now. Gonna, this ain't going to work out, <laughs> thankfully. So you're going to be enemies. And um, uh, it was definitive that uh, they were to be separate. And so now there's kind of a target on her back because of that. And, uh, but we see this thing unfold. And uh, uh, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And what he's doing is questioning God's word or get, did God in fact or did he or would he even in that sense. Would he say that and did he? And the woman said to the serpent, Oh, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it. And here's the big mistake, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. She added that. Uh, and that becomes a problem when you add to the Word of God, you add uh, the curses to you, it says, or if you take away, you take away your name out of the Lamb's Book of Life. And so, out of the Book of Life. And so here's a situation right from the beginning, the battle that we have with spiritual issues to add to or to take away or to have any discussion at all with the devil about it. When the devil's picking on you, you louse, who do you think you are praying? Who do you think you are doing this? Are you going to witness? Come on. I, I know who you are. Don't share the gospel with somebody. And we go, well, I, and you start talking, you know, and, it's, you're saying, well, and defending yourself. You don't have to. You, your dialogue should be with the Lord. It should turn to, Lord, thank you for the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. I'm going to talk to this person about the Lord because I know you can make me a vessel. And uh, move on. Because as soon as you start a dialogue with them, you're, you're in trouble. And it, 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 uh, it, it, it's, def it's a defeating mechanism he uses. And so the Spirit said to the woman, Oh, you'll surely not die. Come on. Kind of mockingly almost. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open. Oh, wouldn't you like that? Wouldn't you like your eyes open here? You want to... You want the experience of a lifetime. Take some LSD. Your eyes will be open and, you know, all this stuff. Whatever, whatever it is to open your eyes, you know, experience this or that. Open your eyes. Um, 
God knows the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, you'll knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. I think based upon what Proverbs says in the seduction of men and what they have to be careful of and what it says uh, in the New Testament concerning uh, Eve being deceived and uh, what that means, that she was deceived and I think he was seduced. I mean, she was standing there with the fruit, whatever it was, and just you know, kind of looked at him and blink, 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 you know, <laughs> whatever. And now uh, you oh, okay, you know, <laughs> he just took it. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together uh, and made themselves covering. So the sense of conscience and the sense of uh, things not being right and awareness now of their nakedness, which they didn't have before, and uh, they make fig leaves. Just a, a, a kind of a religious statement in a sense. They're going to cover up their sin. Uh, with their own means. Well, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God, like you could do that, um, among the trees of the garden. So, you know, mankind is still hiding from God in that sense, doing everything they can to stay away from him. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? And... Uh, isn't it weird how things go through your mind? The commercial with the Verizon, can you hear me now? And I just thought the Lord called him and he says, can you hear me? Anyway. Uh, <laughs> so he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, oh, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of the, that I commanded you that you should not eat? And so this is where we, we were uh, last week going through all of this. And then the, the, the man said, uh, well, the Satan dis uh, came and spoke to my wife and, and deceived her. He didn't say that, did he? He didn't go to the source of the problem, to the evil. Instead, he blames God. The woman who you, hey, you gave me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. So, ain't my problem. This sin nature is in every one of us. You know, God help the families of the shooting and all the things that have happened there, but the nature of what happens afterwards of all these things, uh, not just that, but other things like that, and you watch the news and you think, this is amazing. The first thing that was said was not about this criminal, this deviant, this wicked, evil, evil, person it was about it's the president you gave us <laughs> or it's about gun control or it's about the whatever and it took them you know and even when they started talking about the guy that they know did it it was kind of like oh well he's he's hurting and he's sorry and he's broken and he's evil it just, it's amazing how it's, it's just in us to skip around and point to evil. People don't want to deal with evil. And uh, there's a, I spoke a little about it last week, and then I came across this quote by Ravi Zacharias when he was in a college uh, seminar, and uh, they were asking some, you know, some well-thought-out questions, and one of them was about um, the evil in the world and everything else and, and uh, what to do about it. And, and, but, but saying the sense of, well, if there's evil in the world, there's too much of it, and why is there evil, and, and uh, I don't even believe in good, and you know, this kind of rambling statement, and his answer was this. When you say there's too much evil in the world, you assume there's good. When you assume there's good, you assume there's such a thing as a moral law on the basis of which to differentiate between good and evil. Makes sense? But if you assume a moral law, you must posit a moral lawgiver. But that's who you're trying to dis disprove and not prove. Because if there's no moral lawgiver, there's no moral law. If there's no moral law, there's no good. If there's no good, there's no evil. So what's your question? <laughs> I love his statements. 
Um, you just can't get away from Genesis 3 is the point. It deals with the moral lawgiver. It deals with the sin issue. It deals with God's dealing with the sin. And it deals with how good and evil became part of our life in the first place. So it's a very important chapter, and it's just so deep. But this is the, so the man says, well, it's the woman you gave to be with me, and she gave uh, the tree, and I ate. And the Lord said to the woman, uh, so first thing he does, he blames God, and then he blames the woman. Uh, neither issue did he blame the devil. The Bible says, a battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness at this present age. It's never really about the person in front of you, especially in a relationship. It's about what's going on behind the scenes. What is the devil stirring up? What's happening? Then the man said to the, uh, it's the woman you gave me, and the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, well, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the fact that I was deceivable wasn't the issue uh, because we, we know that in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, or that's another one, but in uh, Titus that she uh, was deceived, James, I'm sorry, James chapter one, she was deceived and because of her lust. I'll, I'll go over that in just a second. So the, the uh, relationship here, she just puts it on the devil and leaves it as if, and so I ate. What did you expect me to do? It's kind of, he deceived me, and what do you want? Of course I ate. And... Um, the Lord said to the serpent, so he deals directly with the serpent, which is what they should have done. Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. So physically, the, this um, uh, snake then would, would uh, propagate snakes like it, always crawling on his belly. You shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. I was doing a, a home Bible study some 40 years ago, and... Uh, uh, I'll never forget it because this uh, guy there said, uh, said, wait a minute, stop, 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 stop. If you can prove that, I'll give my life to Jesus Christ. And I thought, well, I don't know anything about it, but okay, I know the Bible's true. So I went to the library and I looked up stuff about snake and there's everything about their DNA and all this stuff and the python's DNA is like our DNA and all the other data, uh, others aren't and all these other things you find and, and elaborate things of their scales and all this stuff and uh, oh, this is not good. So I thought, hmm, I wonder if it's simpler. So I took out a child's book <laughs> and uh, in there it says, now snakes crawl on their belly and when they do, to feel movement around them, it isn't so much with their eyes, their tongue goes out and hits the dust. And they can tell by the dust, not only the taste of what's around, animals or other things they're looking for, but vibrations, if there's an enemy lurking around, moving. And so I gave them, I said, you know, I couldn't find it in the library anyway. I looked up, you know, this book on it, and I checked out, I said, I'm really, and he goes, oh, see, I, don't, I said, but, it seemed to be simpler than that. I found a children's book. I just rubbed it in. <laughs> I had to, he read it, and I'll never forget. He said, can we pray? And he gave his life to Christ and walked with the Lord since. Remember him? I'm looking at my wife, yeah. And um, uh, anyway, he says, on, the, uh, on your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And this is interesting. Now, as a, as a judgment, you only bring a judgment based upon something that's a problem, right? So you, the judgment would be the opposite. You're free, you're going to jail, right? Uh, in, in the Old Testament, it was you stole, take off your hands, so you can't steal anymore, that kind of thing. Well, he says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman. That tells us that there wasn't. She was talking with him. They were, they were buds, they were you know, having a dialogue, the whole thing. So, and we know from Genesis 6, there's a lot more on his concepts uh, than, than we first might think. And between your seed, not seeds, we were part of this, this, the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve, that's a given, but as far as this, this part, between your seed and her seed, which would be Christ, the one, he shall bruise, speaking that seed, your head, he's gonna bruise the head of the, the devil, and you shall bruise his heel, Christ's heel, the spikes going in his heel, the first prophecy of the cru crucifixion. Then he says to the woman, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception, and in pain you shall bring forth children. 
So I guess the original intention in the garden was that they would have children and there would be no pain in, in giving childbirth. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case after the, <laughs> after, uh, um, after the fall. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And I want to come back to that because uh, we'll take a serious look at the wording of that and why it's so difficult to, to, you find so many translations going all over the place trying to resolve it. Uh, I talked to William Walty, uh, the producer of the ISV Bible, a Hebrew scholar, and he ran this down for me to make sure I was heading in the right direction. And so I'll, I'll share with you, but it really is the cause for domestic violence and, and why the battles and all this sexual harassment and everything else take place comes from this curse. So we'll look at that in a second. But first of all, the target is on women. Um, it's, of course, you know, he hates every believer, men and women both, but there's obviously a, this curse that takes place against her in this particular thing. And um, God says uh, uh, concerning her that in 1 Peter 3, 7, she is the weaker vessel. So some people take that to mean because she was deceived, she was the weaker vessel. I don't think so because we can all be deceived. The scriptures are very clear on that. But Eve's um, uh, entrapment was by her um, uh, being deceived. The devil used that and, uh, and caused her to, to fall. So I don't think it's that. It's not, some will say, well, uh, because she's more emotional than a man and her brain is more like spaghetti. It goes all over the place, so she thinks of not only logic, but emotion simultaneously, where men tend to think more of logic and emotion as a separate, distinct issue, and, and so on. So I don't think that that's a, uh, would be considered a weakness. Um, that's not, uh, uh, I don't think that's the issue. It's just real basic. She has 28% less muscle mass, and she is weaker in that sense. Now, uh, would I get in the ring with the WWF ladies wrestling uh, champion? No, but if you took the man who won the latest WWF wrestling and put him in the ring with her, you know, it's a different story. In other words, if you matched him up, uh, man for woman, woman for man, depending on, like skiers, some women skiers, I mean, I wouldn't even dare get near how good they are at it, but you put them next to a man, it's a different, you know, now it's more of a matchup. So I thought about that. I thought, well, am I right about this or what's going on? And the reason why I bring it up is this is part of the onslaught against women based upon this curse in our world today. Started in the late 20s, was um, uh, jumped up in the 40s when they talked about putting women, brought women into the, um, into the Olympics and then uh, into today with feminism and everything else. And that the crux of this is it isn't the idea of um, women being all that they can be. What they want women to be is men. That's the big difference. And that's part of this curse, and we'll see it in a minute. This authority, this idea of not just being a, a, a intellectual, strong, if they're an athlete, whatever woman, but to be the man. And the prob of course the problem with that is it doesn't leave a man any place to go. And when you consider a woman can put on a man's suit or baseball outfit or whatever and look hot. But a man puts on a dress, <coughs> I, I'm, nah, it doesn't look hot. Nothing good about it. Where does he go? I mean, really, and, and there's such a dilemma now for the generation growing up. A lot of the girls don't know what to do. Do they let somebody open the door for them? Or no, I, I don't need somebody to open the door. And I'll carry all my groceries. I'll do all my stuff. I don't need your help. I'm, you know, I want to prove I'm, I can do it. And, and, and part of this is part of the curse, and we're losing the concept of a lady. We lost the concept of a gentleman a long time ago when they started calling criminals gentlemen. <laughs> but the idea of what it means to be a godly man and to be a godly woman. So um, I got to thinking about this and, and I thought, well, the, the best of the best in the world, how about if we compare them just to see, because the Bible says the woman is weaker. So facts should back that up, right? Just like 
We sit on the globe of the earth. Globe meaning sphere, world, and sure enough, they find out later on it's not flat, it's round. You know, the Bible's true kind of thing. So, um, because all of this really comes down to the idea of, um, uh, of a control factor. Who, who, there's a battle of control in this world right now, and the media is on the side of the secularism and anti-God, anti-Christian, uh, anti uh, um, biblical thought or truth and, and tries to change that. That's just, just the sinful nature. The other day, Jada had this little controller, you know, for a game controller. And you know, in any house, who has the, the battle's always over the whether it's the TV or anything else, it's the controller. And so she's got the controller, and the boys are, yeah, give me that. No, I got I. And she did something instinctively that just kind of caught me off guard. She's, there, she's going, no, it's mine. Now, she's out of that room, the game's in the other room. And she stands back and she looks at both of them and she goes, you go here, you go there. Like the controller could control them. And I thought, that's really what she was after was control over them and she had the controller to, by taking it, she had control over them but now she was gonna use it on them. And in her little mind, you know, and I thought, wow, this is this interesting. Um, but what is the woman's image? And I would really hope that as a Christian lady the image of who you are would be the image that Christ has, not what the world wants to put on you. Uh, when it comes to muscles in a woman, here's a picture of what the world would like to see uh, you as a woman be. Uh, I don't know if she uses steroids, eh. <laughs> but, but what happens in the Olympics? This is even a bigger picture, let me show you. Um, in the men's hurdle, you see the women run the race, you see the men, and you see, uh, Time sometimes look pretty close or different things. Sometimes the distances are different, depends on whether it's the Olympics or the world events. But one thing is always consistent. The men's hurdle is 36 inches high, the women's is 30 inches high. Makes a difference, doesn't it? Now I say that because they, uh, it took me forever to find a comparison between men and women on, uh, on the Olympics. It was like it's buried. In fact, in some cases, it, anyway, it's just, uh, it's just amazing to, to look that stuff up. I've got a, a s stack of stuff I finally went through and, and I'm just gonna minimize it to a few things, but it's literally in every single event. Uh, pole vault, the men, um, it's about 19 feet, translate this to feet, and uh, the women about 16 feet. Uh, the triple jump, 18 plus, uh, what's this, millimeters, I guess it would be, you know, uh, M is what? Meters. Uh, 18 meters and the women, 15 meters. But then, and you think, okay, well, there's a slight difference, but shot put. The women, um, 20, uh, 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 men are 22.52 meters. Women, 22.41 meters. That's really close, isn't it? You see some of these really strong women putting that shot. The woman's shot put is eight pounds, the man's shot put is 16 pounds. I didn't know that until I looked it up. <laughs> the, um, uh, the women are in the heptathlon, which is seven events. They get a, the, the Jackie Joyner, for instance, once set a record 7,291 points. Uh, the men are in a decathlon, 10 events, and it's over 8,000 points. Uh, difference for a reason, because th these are world competitions, and so they want to make it an exciting world event where a lot of people could get involved, women, men, and, and have this, so they make it so that it's competitive, but uh, athletic. They don't want to destroy them, yeah, give them something weaker they couldn't really accomplish as well as far as the scope of all the women. The long jump, women, uh, or men, 8.90, and the women, 7.40. Um, anyway, so I, I thought, well, what about weightlifting? Because you see some of these women, and I think, you know, no contest, you know, stay out of the weight room if they're in there, you know. Uh, this one is by the, the Sports Illustrated. She's named the strongest woman in the world. And they, the power lifts, the squat, the bench, and the deadlift, her total was 1,200 pounds. When you take the total of all the things that she picked up, right? 1,200 pounds. That is a stat. And obviously, she is one strong woman. 
Then a couple of other guys both accomplished this with the total power lift of being the strongest men in the world because there were three of them actually that did the same thing. Uh, 2,425 pounds. My point is when you match equal, you know, not an old retired um, tennis player to some new <laughs> young athletic tennis player kind of thing. You know, when you, when you match them uh, age for age and everything else and athlete for athlete, uh, the difference is significant. The women are weaker in that sense. And, um, but the image that is portrayed, and let me show you another guy. This is a, a muscular guy who's, yeah, no, the next one. Been working out, obviously. There you go. Now, I don't know if he's used steroids or not, but I mean, he's obviously worked out and, and, and done it right as far as what his body potential is when you work out. And of course, and then there's me as a comparison. Uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the point is that there's a deception going on. It's very subtle, but it's very profound. And even the manipulation of the 18, 8 pounds and uh, 16 pounds shot put and everything else, that's why they don't go. You say, well, why don't they race together? Why don't they do these things together? It's because it would be no contest. That's why. It's just that simple. But what they want to do is Amazonianize kind of thing and, and say, well, women, you don't just can't be the best woman. You can be a man. And it's, um, it's so destructive to, to society because, well, number one, the man's got no place to go if the image is fulfilled. And the other is it, it harms the woman uh, because not all can be that and do that. Um, but they're not allowed to be feminine, to really be women of God. And um, uh, when you see the biblical example, for instance, you've got the spiritual, fa uh, the spiritual example of the father looks out for the son, and the son does only the will of the father, and he sends the spirit, and the spirit submits and does the will, and he's called helper, but all three are God, and yet Jesus said, you know, you can, you can blaspheme the father, you can blaspheme the son, but you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, he won't defend himself, but we will. And you won't see the light of day. You're damned. It's pretty heavy. But there's, there's a significance there in the sense of, of what it means as far as the, the responsibilities and the role that we're made for to, to live out isn't based upon equality. They are called, in Genesis chapter 5, Adam. In other words, totally equal. Not bond, city, and slave, free, male or female, we're all one in Christ. But that's in Christ. Outside of Christ, after the fall, there's a problem. Now, uh, I remember my, uh, my dad was a uh, pretty abusive man, and he was an alcoholic and so many levels a good father and so many other levels not. And I can remember one time very distinctly where he, my mother told my brother to call the police and uh, my brother went for the phone and a big you know, thing happened and anyway he didn't call. And, and in those days you called the police and they said, oh, it's um, home disturbance, you know, domestic disturbance. And it was like, okay, you guys work it out. And they left, they didn't do anything. But uh, anyway, didn't make the phone call. And my dad used to walk about, I don't know, 10 steps ahead of my mother, not because he, was, he walked fast, which he did, I tend to also, but he didn't even pay attention that he was doing it, didn't think about it. He was, um, I don't think he listened to her. Uh, I don't think he paid attention to her in so many ways, loved her, but sin nature, he didn't know any different. Then he got saved. 56 years old, so he's got a whole adult history of being like this and being through the Navy and all the rest of it. And uh, I didn't tell him 
And nobody else did. Gee, you should walk next to your wife when you walk down the street. But all of a sudden, he did. I didn't tell him to stop raising your voice to her. But he didn't anymore. I didn't tell him to listen to her. But all of a sudden, he started listening. He paid attention. He really showed Christ's love to her. And it's because it came from the inside out, not because of rules and laws on the outside in. He was transformed, but his sin nature was one to just do that and think it was okay. But on the other hand, he treated her like a lady. Always opened the car door for her, he was polite to her, all of those things. But on the other hand, he was always the man. And by that I mean we were in a, uh, my dad owned a restaurant down the street, it was a bar and a restaurant. And he, he had four businesses here on the boulevard at the time and one of them was this bar and restaurant. And uh, I remember sitting there and somebody, some guy had been drinking too much and said something about whatever, I don't know exactly what it was. And, and my dad responded and said, hey, you've probably had enough, you should go. And they mouthed off to him and he said, no, really, I, you know, I own the place and I'm telling you just, you know, have a drink on me and go kind of thing. And I was kind of listening, learning how, you know, how do you handle people, right? And then the guy said something about my mother, his wife. <laughs> and uh, what I'm f afraid of is in today's world, there's happening in New York, we've documented in New York, in uh, um, London and other places where men watch women get beat up, get raped in the street, another thing, and, and it's kind of like, well, you can handle yourself. They don't really say that, but that's what they think because they're not doing anything about it. Well, they said something about my, uh, <laughs> my mother and his wife, and he said, outside. <laughs> he came back, and they didn't. His knuckles were bloody, and that was just the end of that discussion. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's how you do it. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what it is. But when he got saved, the gentleness of being a man to his wife was developed by the Spirit at the same time he never forgot she was the weaker vessel. And you don't mess with his family or his wife. That's biblical thinking. Now, um, let's take a look at what it says here in Genesis when it comes to the curse and how this unfolds. I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception and pain. You'll bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband. Now some translate this toward your husband, but he shall rule over you. Some translate it, your desire shall be to rule over your husband, but he shall rule over you. Different uh, words, and it's difficult to translate, so I'll give you the difficulty of it so you'll understand why it's translated that way. It's teshuka, and the word it comes is also used uh, when on the next uh, section, in Genesis 5, uh, or uh, let's see here, Cain and Abel, I got my notes stuck on here, uh, where he says, you, uh, if you do well, will not sin, will you be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire, its tesuka, is for you, but you shall rule over it. Its turning is the word, shall rule over you. It's turning over you. And it's a word that means everything's going to be turned against you kind of thing, but he's going to turn against you. Okay? He's going to do that to you. And so he's saying to, um, to, to, to her, your desire to rule over your husband. It, uh, it's not a curse to desire your husband. The curse would be to rule over him or to turn, be a turning to him. But he shall, and the word is dominate you. That's part of the curse. So a man that does not know the Lord, and uh, his attitude towards women is authoritarian. It is sexual harassment. It is sexual abuse. It can be domestic violence, and all sorts of things. And around the world, you find it is pandemic, it's everywhere in the world, the abuse of women, either to marry more than one and kind of put them in their place, you're my maid, you're having babies, and you're for my comfort, and so on, 
or they are physically abused, or in some cases, you know, rape and everything else and sex trafficking because of the fall, because of this fall. So what is the cure? What can happen? This, this turning, this teshuka, this odd word uh, that would now be upon her towards him, to, to this turning ag- against him or to rule over him that women are born with. Kind of this attitude is, I know more than you. They, they just assume it. Just there. And one of the things about uh, Ephesians, it says when you get married in a biblical marriage, it says you are subject to your husband. What that means is, you marry an alcoholic, don't think you're going to change him. You're subject to that. You, that's who you married. Women tend to marry thinking, even to that degree, I'll, I'll fix him. I can fix him. And they leave out God. And that's the problem here. She left out God. He said, so now your God is going to be your husband because you left God out. Now, what's the solution? Does everybody follow that? On the same page? Uh, It's a really odd scripture when you really take the time to go through it. So then what happened though is he took this little lamb Imagine this. Here's all these animals. Everything's just, they're, you know, they're having fun. They're running around and they're pets and they're everywhere. He brings this lamb over, slits its throat. Blood is spilt for the first time in paradise. And he makes a coat for both of them. Covers their sin by the shed blood of this lamb. And then he says, now, get out of the garden. But because he had shed the blood for them, the garden would always be in them. They would now know the forgiveness of what they had done and they could be different. He could love her as Christ loves the church. She could submit to him as the church does to Jesus Christ. They could submit together. They could have reverence. They could have respect and all of these things and she would then be called the mother of all living. So sin is crouching at the door for every one of their inheritances, for all of us? Yes. But when we repent and give our life to the Lamb whose blood was shed before the foundation of the world, the one that died for us, he takes us back into the garden. And then we can be the men that God wants us to be, made us to be, and the women that God made us, made you to be and wants you to be. That you can fulfill that role because you're not under this curse when you give your life to Jesus Christ. That's a huge difference. And that's what the world is looking for. That's why he says that the, in Ephesians that the, the uh, marriage is the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the very mystery that they see this phenomenal thing take place in a marriage that other marriages don't ha- have. They see respect. They see submission, they see love, they see grace, and yet at the same time they see this protection, this covering. They see it the way it's supposed to be. And if it isn't, the way to fix it is not to make a God out of marriage or out of each other, but put God in the center. And you're on the outside and you make a strong triangle. But you get your strength from the Lord, not from each other. Now you relate to each other based upon that strength, but you get your your relationship bound up in Christ, not each other. Because what happens too often is when it's an ungodly relationship, and let's say you have a godly woman, she gets saved and everything else, and he's beating her up. Or he's abusive towards her. Or he's just constantly railing on her, and belittling her and everything else. And she's, well, I don't know if he's committed adultery so I can't divorce him, but she's getting a black eye every Friday. And you think God's going, well, you know, until he sleeps around, you're stuck with him. No, where it says, except for the cause of adultery. That word is not adultery. Look it up. It's pornea. And the word pornea is a lot bigger than simply p- today's pornography. It used to be statues or whatever, and now it's, you know, uh, all over the internet and all this other stuff. But it's bigger than that. The word literally meant 
physical and emotional and sexual abuse, any one of the three. He's, if that woman is not being treated as God would have her to be treated, as his princess, as his daughter, he's, you've got cause for divorce. Now the reason why he said it, because the Jews had divorced a woman for, they burned the toast. Said, well, I'll give you writing a divorcement, you're divorced, I'll get another one, I don't like the way you made breakfast. He says, no, except for these things, if there's physical, emotional, sexual abuse. But it wasn't, the sexual abuse would be adultery, in other words. God's relationship to us is not to make the marriage a God in and of itself, and people go through all this horrendous problem sometimes, and then they blame God, and I have a terrible life because you won't let me divorce the, the idiot, you know. And God says, no, no, that's not it at all. Put God first. Seek first the kingdom of your mate. You see, that's what she was doing. She wasn't listening to what God said. She added to that, which meant she added to what Adam had. And he said, your curse now is that he's going to rule over you. So how do you break the curse? The blood of Jesus Christ, the lamb. So they got together. They had children. And the sin nature is still there. Cain killed Abel. But remember, Abel did the right thing. Cain did the wrong thing. So sin still crouches at the door of each one of our hearts. And it's not a matter of, you know, who do we blame? We look to ourselves as David did and said, God, I've sinned against thee and, the, thee and thee alone. That's why God said, David, you're a man after my heart. Not because he didn't sin, but because he owned it. When he did, he, and he didn't do it again. It's that relationship with Jesus Christ as God Almighty by the shed blood of the Lamb that we become men of God, real men and women, ladies, real ladies, the bride of Christ. And to understand it's a privilege to be either one and to be together or even to be single and serve him because ultimately it's our relationship to him that makes our relationship with each other work. Until that's settled in someone's life, the abuse, the male chauvinism, whatever you want to call it, is part of the sin nature. The suffering, the angst, and everything that goes with it to try to fix it rather than go to God will remain for the women. But when either or both give their life to Jesus Christ, and my wife and I saw that when we gave our life to the Lord both within a week of each other, it changed everything. Not because we had it together right away, but we both had, I can remember when we both said to each other, whatever you do is up to you, but I'm serving the Lord. And we couldn't be any more in love now than we were, I mean, we're more in love now than we were then, but we couldn't be any more in love, I don't think. Because it's God that's first in our life, and that's what they needed. And when they shed the blood of the lamb and clothed them, they got it. Something had to die for them. And somebody died for us. Jesus Christ. So that you could be what you've been, what you've been meant to be, not what the world says you should be. God help the next generation that thinks women are supposed to kick in every door and five foot two woman is supposed to take down a six foot six man and cuff him and throw him on the ground like he's a <laughs> piece of paper. Come on. No. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the call of God upon our lives, whether male or female, and that there is a distinct difference and the world wants to blur that is the, the ultimate goal and transgender and all the rest of the stuff eventually to get to the place where there's no, no gender meaning at all which totally defiles the very word of God. We pray Father for your guidance and your wisdom as we live our life for the Lord to be an example that it would be a part of bringing a revival before the last days before that last day that people would see how evil evil is how bad bad is and how gloriously wonderful good is when they come to you as their good Lord and Savior. <coughs> Excuse me. And Lord, right now, for those that don't know you or, or live church ex existence and not knowing you, 
Just pray with me right now. God, forgive me for my sin, for my complacency in, in anything carnal or worldly concerning these matters. Forgive me, come into my life. Thank you for the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for dying for me. Come into my heart and my life. Save my soul. Make me into the man or the woman that I was meant to be, Lord, before your throne. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Difficult subject. I hope I've explained it sufficiently um, because it is a battleground in the campuses, uh, in the Olympics, in the presentation of what the press, who they interview and what they, they make out to be the real issue and what's important, you know, and, and leaving out the rest to get this kind of mob mentality of what, what's supposed to happen. We always need to go back to, okay, but God, what did you say? It hasn't changed. Show us your purpose and your plan. What do you want to accomplish? Uh, you know, when that, uh, that coach stood up in front of some of those kids and took the shots, I just grieved my heart that he couldn't have been armed, quite frankly. I just have to tell you the truth because I think he would have been the first one to nail the guy. But the fact that he'd put his life on the line no matter what. Domestic violence isn't a man. Sexual assault isn't a man. Harassment isn't a man. That's a man. Whether it's protecting children or women, that's a man. Now, does that mean that a woman can't be a hero and all of those things? No, she can be a police officer or whatever. But to be the best female, she can be for whatever her calling is. Not to take the place of the man. That's totally different. And it's a loss for all of society. So I pray God gives us wisdom, discernment, grace, and most of all, to understand the value of the gospel to change society. It's happened in the past. Revivals that have transformed countries. And it can happen again. God bless you.